It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Yes, welcome to The After Show on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and we are broadcasting live and waiting to hear from you, our audience, at the end of day three of the DSP Leaders World Forum 2021. We have a great lineup of guests joining us again today, primed and ready to answer your questions. We've already received some, but please do keep them coming. You can use the form on the website below this video. Time to introduce my co-host for the after show, Ray LeMaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Hello again, Ray. Today's theme has been cultural transformation. What have been the highlights for you? Well, Guy, I'm glad you asked because it's been a packed day three. We've had a wide ranging interview with Kerry Gilder, who has now been in the CEO chair at Colt for more than nine months. We've had conversations with Nokia's Jan van Tietering and Red Hat's Honoré Laboudet, who's also with us on this programme right now, plus two roundtable discussions, one focused on developing the skill sets required for the migration to a cloud-oriented DSP, and one on the impact of technology choices for the cloud-native telco. So we've got plenty to discuss today. Back to you, Guy. Thanks, Ray. Yes, and I really enjoyed those panels earlier. Some excellent ideas and insights came out of them, and I'm sure we're about to hear more because joining us live on the programme today are Angela Jenner, who is Transformation Director, Service Platforms at BT, Nathan Rader, VP Cloudified Production at Deutsche Telekom, Andrea Calvi, VP Technology Innovation at TIM, Honoré Labadet, Vice President, Industry Verticals and Edge, Telco Media and Entertainment at Red Hat, and Stephen Spilici, VP Product Marketing and Solutions, Telco and Edge Cloud at VMware. Well, hello everyone, good to see you all again, back for more. Lots of questions to get through in the next 45 minutes or so. Ray, over to you to get us started. Great, thanks Guy. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, Angela, but before we get into the questions, a quick question just for you, and we're gonna be asking this of all of our guests. What got you into telecoms? How did you start your career in this industry? So um, I started working with a telco in New Zealand uh, many years ago, and that was Telecom New Zealand, now Spark. I then uh, worked for another systems integrator in, in the UK before going back to a telco, uh, which was TalkTalk. Talk. Um, and then following that, I have worked in the media and the mobile industries, and I've combined all of those by moving into BT, which is um, covering mobile, media, and uh, telecoms. So it's a great combination there. Fantastic, great experience there. Uh, so thanks for joining us uh, today. So uh, first audience question, I'm gonna put this one uh, starting with uh, you, Angela. So do telcos need to employ people with specific skill sets for specific technologies? Or is it better now to find people with more general abilities that telcos can then train to their needs as technology changes? Um, so what's the current thinking at BT about this? Uh, right, I think it's a, it's a combination of both. So I think there are definitely times where you need to hire in very specific skill sets to, to get a job done. But equally, now we are more about the flexibility that people can bring to a role. We know that, you know, technology is moving at such a pace that people need to continually learn and develop new things. So I think it's a combination of where the need is there for a very specific skill set and you need to get that into to deliver a, a project or do a specific piece of work that's absolutely still necessary, where you can be a bit more flexible and um, bring in, in people that you can train and learn and upskill. I think that's great. And there will always be that need for people to be learning and upskilling as technology moves at the pace that it's going. Great, thanks, Angela. Um, uh, anybody else want to comment on, on this question at all? I would say that as the networks get smarter, you know, there's more of a reliance on data and real-time analytics and driving decisioning in a with AI. Skills around data science are really in high demand. Um, and I think any, any CSP out there who's looking to apply these concepts, you know, at scale is going to need a 
a fairly significant staff investment. So this is an area potentially where you know, if you find those people and you can bring them across, if you will, the chasm to the telecom world, um, they can add great benefit. Okay, great. And, uh, and Nathan, did you want to come in there as well? I, I do think that there's going to be a mix of specialists and generalists. And from, from that perspective, there, there are some key positions that do require some, some highly skilled individuals that have a very specific set of, of, of requirements. And, and that may be when we're talking about open source technologies, people who have developed a relationship with the community and, and have the ability to, to upstream patches and, and, have, and, uh, and make those things. But then there may be just general folks that operate the cloud, manage clouds, uh, manage our, our workloads and things like that. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, so I think uh, time to uh, hand back to Guy and move on to the next question. Guy, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Um, next question we've got in. I, actually, I think I'll go back to Nathan, if you don't mind, and uh, address this one to Nathan first. But before I do, um, as Ray has asked Angela, I'm going to ask you the same one, Nathan, and that is, what got you into telecoms? How did you get your start in, in this industry of ours? Kind of, kind of interesting, actually. I, uh, I went to school and have a degree in aerospace engineering. Uh, however, I graduated at an inopportune time in the industry, which was right after the September 11 attacks. And so the, the aviation industry had, had virtually collapsed. Uh, and as a student employee, I had been working for the university uh, doing uh, telco, working on the, the school's campus network, the campus PBX, actually. And uh, I was then offered a, a job as a new grad uh, type of a, a program into Nokia, where I spent the, the next year going through pretty much every theoretical uh, training back in the day around signaling SS7, radio propagations, and, and the whole mess. So quite a, quite a departure from, from aerospace engineering. Brilliant. It's a great example of how you know you, people enter this industry, not necessarily from the, you know, the academic routes that you, you think that they need. That's terrific. Um, here's our viewer question though, Nathan, and that is, telcos have to deploy unique legacy workloads that were specified long before the days of cloud native, which makes the transition to cloud native difficult. So should all new standards therefore be created with cloud native in mind? I, I do. I, I think we really should focus on cloud native. Uh, the cloud is not going away anytime soon, um, but neither are our legacy workloads. So we are going to evolve those standards through 3GPP and others to take our existing uh, workloads and, and, and get them running in this cloud native environment with standards. Um, but anything that becomes new, so you know, we've got 5G today, but 6G coming down the, down the pipeline at some point in time. And, and from that, I do think we should be looking uh, at uh, standardizing around cloud native. But I actually think we should almost take it one step further. Uh, if you look at most modern uh, tech companies, everything is communicating via APIs now. And I think that one of the big, the big keys is to start focusing on, on ensuring that our network functions and others communicate in, in more modern uh, modern ways such as RESTful APIs versus the traditional uh, legacy standard interfaces that we have, have built from the past. So I, I think we need to, to kind of not only go towards cloud native, but take that next step also and, and look towards the, the future of how the, these, these, uh, these pieces communicate with each other. And that should be via, via common APIs. Thank you, Nathan. Any of other guests want to uh, jump in with a response to this question, which is all about whether the new standards and specifications we create now, we should ensure that they're designed with cloud native in mind? I'll just say if the dream is to get to a fully autonomous network that's self-healing, self-optimizing, uh, we're going to need to look at uh, flexible architectures and cloud native definitely provides that. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and I'll go straight to Andrea as well. Yeah, my comment is, uh, um, I think we're all moving towards cloud native. Uh, from your question, we got, um, what I got is, uh, as a, let's say, uh, tier one telco with a lot of legacy uh, technology and infrastructure, of course, uh, the way could be a bit more uh, complicated and should be approached step by step. Uh, um, it's much simpler for some, someone entering the, the field uh, uh, from Greenfield, um, but definitely we're getting there. 
Okay, thank you very much, Andrea, for that. Thank you for our guests for that one. Uh, Honoré? Uh, yes, I would agree with group in that uh, the cloud-native applications are going to be necessary, especially as we think about um, edge applications and enterprise privacy use cases. I think cloud-native applications are going to be the catalyst to really deliver on the capabilities that everybody is wanting to see uh, for the vertical use cases at the edge. Great. Thanks very much for that. Um, well, Ray, I think we'll uh, hand back to you for our, our next set of questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Guy. Uh, so, Andrea, I'm going to uh, come to you with this question. But first, like with our other guests, I'm going to ask you, what got you into the telecoms industry? How do you get your first step on the ladder? Yes, thanks. Uh, well, in some way, uh, my answer is similar to what Nathan uh, j j just, just told us. Um, uh, I didn't focus uh, during my study in, in telecommunication. Uh, I was focusing in electronic engineering. And then uh, I remember we were visiting uh, during, during the, the one of the course, uh, the Telecom Italia, the team, are at the center. And uh, honestly, I think it, at that time, uh, I started falling in love with that kind of uh, technology. It was uh, uh, antennas, it was lasers, so it was fiber optics, etc., etc. And uh, so I also sort of shifted my focus uh, from the, let's say, the, the, the study course towards the, let's say, the, 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 the real life and the work. Excellent. Uh, great, great to hear. Good, good mix of stories today and uh, contrasting with our earlier um, uh, speakers in the week. Um, so now we've got a question coming in and, and I get the feeling that this one has come in after somebody has uh, perhaps watched one of our uh, earlier on-demand sessions. Uh, but the question is, is the telecom vendor community now ready to support network operators with the cloud native processes and technologies that they need or is there still work to be done by the networking technology developers? So in terms of cloud native, can the vendor community already now be giving the, the telecom operators what they need in terms of cloud native support? Andrea. If you uh, had asked me this question a couple of years ago, uh, I would have been a bit less certain, let's say. But uh, now uh, my impression is uh, the, the vendor community is there, is quite solid, uh, and uh, I think um, telcos, even the, the, the big ones, now uh, have uh, um, definitely enough support from the vendor community in order to move on, uh, towards the, the, the cloud native. For sure, uh, some of the incumbent vendor could be a bit reluctant to move uh, let's say very fast or to be early adopters of, of cloud uh, cloud native uh, all this innovation uh, disaggregation uh, containers uh, uh, automation everything like this uh, maybe some of the incumbents can can not be the first to embrace it but this is totally understandable uh, but now I yeah. see that the process is uh, is quite uh, is quite uh, mature, and uh, um, there's no way back from from my point of view. Uh, as telco, uh, we definitely need, need what cloud native can bring in terms of uh, let's say uh, efficiency, uh, uh, the right uh, TCO, uh, so the right ratio between performance and cost, and definitely it can make us. Uh, uh, gain a huge uh, step ahead in terms of time to market. Excellent. Um, would anybody, anybody else like to come in and, and comment on the, the maturity of the, the vendor sector in terms of cloud native? Yeah, I, I just make a, maybe a quick comment. So um, I think the, the vendors themselves are, are not quite there yet, but they're definitely on their way there. And I think that there's some some interesting partnerships that are taking place in the vendor ecosystem where we're starting to see um, hyperscalers partnering with some of the, the, the kind of traditional telco vendors and, and helping them improve upon their, their VNF. So I think that's a, that's a very positive thing I, I'm seeing in the industry, at least, where, where they're starting to, to collaborate together to, to drive from the cloud vendor to the, the, the um, 
uh, the, the, the workload vendors, um, you know, collaborating to, to get that cloud nativeness matured quicker. Okay, excellent. Okay, I think uh, as I know we've got new questions coming in. So Guy, I will hand back to you for the next one. Thank you, Ray. Uh, yes, indeed. And a reminder to our viewers, do keep the questions coming, please. We'll get through as many of them as we possibly can. Right. Um, for our next question, um, Honoré, let me start with by asking you, you know, the, the question we're asking everyone this week, which is how you got into telecoms? How did you get your start in this industry? So my story in telecom is a bit of what I would describe as divine intervention. Um, after college, I decided to move to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, because I wanted to learn how to ski. And after two years of doing that, I was out of money and out of food and uh, decided to get a real life. So I moved to Denver. I had $28 in my pocket. I drove downtown and I looked at the high rise buildings and I saw one that said AT&T. And so I parked, <laughs> I went inside and I applied for a job. And while I was there, there was one of the worst snowstorms in the history of Denver. So new candidates and applicants couldn't get into the building and the people who were there to do the interviewing and go through the hiring process couldn't leave. So I went through the entire hiring process and I was offered a job with AT&T. So that's where I started my career and I've been in telecom and technology ever since. Fantastic story, I love it. Uh well, let's get on to our, our viewer question then. Um, and, and that is, telecoms companies do take a long time to change. Are there any signs that you're seeing that they are adopting open technologies and open cultures and processes? I think that there's more than signs. If you think about uh, the early days of the digital transformation or you know, when Etsy actually defined and released the reference architecture for network functions virtualization, much of the software defined horizontal approach to network infrastructure technology was spawned, incubated, developed and deployed using open source technology. So one could say that the, the telecom industry and the tele telecom customers were in fact really the very early innovators in terms of moving from, you know, hardware, vertical hardware stacks to deploy network services to a software defined horizontal infrastructure. And I believe that they, uh, many of the tier one telcos uh, in all of the, in America, in EMEA and APJ, the larger telcos came forward and said that they were going to uh, embark on their digital transformation journey and software defining these network services using open source technology. One of the added values of using open source technology is in fact the natural tendency to want to embrace an open culture. Uh, they're synonymous and that's actually part of the added value that we have offered to our customers as we partner with them on their journey to migrate from you know, the rigid infrastructures of the past to software defined infrastructures of today, and then moving forward into new greenfield 5G applications or a 5G network infrastructure and the new applications and services that the uh, telecom customers are gonna be able to deploy and to offer to their customers. Uh, it, you know, it seems like a lengthy journey to all of us because technology uh, innovates and refreshes so quickly, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's natural that the journey would take some time because there was a lot to do, right? The, the telco customers actually had a fairly uh, lengthy uh, transformation to undergo. So I, I think we're not seeing signs. I think we saw the signs five, six, seven years ago. I think now, and it, again, it depends on the telco and where they are in that journey. Many of them are not only showing signs, but they're well on their way to digital transformation, to having 5G services in production, to developing cloud native applications and leveraging all of the technology of today. And what we're seeing today, what we're seeing with our customers today is many of them are already starting to look for ways to monetize the return on investment for the investments that they made and for those early deployments of open source technology and the efforts and the attention that they paid to migrating more towards an open culture. 
Um, cultural changes, I, I would say that the cultural changes were probably more difficult than the technology transformation and changes, uh, but the cultural changes were necessary. And I think many of our customers are well on their way uh, of that journey and well on their way to success to embracing open culture. Um, in particular, the customers that we've worked with over the course of their journey. Thank you, Andre. Uh, any of other guests got observations about how telecoms companies are adapting to and using open cultures, open processes? Otherwise, if there's no one else on this point, um, Ray, I'll, I'll hand it straight back to you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, so, um, Stephen, we're going to come to you. We're going to ask you this question. Were there any unusual meteorological conditions that, that got you into telecoms or or was it a different route? Oh, I have a totally non-traditional background. I have, my, my degree is in 20th century composition, film scoring, actually. <laughs> um, but oh, wow. after I after I started to you know, embark on a music uh, oriented uh, career track, I got involved in enterprise IT in the early 90s and into the mid 90s, um, gained a, a, a bunch of acumen in network engineering. And I found my way to, in the late 90s, I found my way to uh, Lucent Technologies at the time, uh, where I was a professional services engineer focused on uh, the access and broadband space. So I really had a hands-on role, learn it from the bottom, if you will, from the bottom up, uh, cross the chasm, if you will, between enterprise networking over to telecommunications. Great, well, uh, excellent story. Very interesting background there. Thanks for sharing. Um, so the question we've had in from our audience, which we're going to start with you today is, um, what difference does a cloud native approach make for 5G operators. So what difference does a cloud native approach make to 5G operators? I think it's important to recognize that 5G was designed in mind to be cloud native and that uh, the technology layers that effectively deliver the 5G services are much in line architecturally with the cloud native concepts. Um, microservices, for instance, the ability to separate various parts, if you will, the application stack is analogous to the kind of disaggregation you see in the network functions. The use of containerization uh, to drive um, the ability to deploy on demand and grow, shrink and grow the network as needed is, is really uh, enabled greatly by cloud native technology. You know, the, if you think about it, cloud native technology has this, um, you know, this or orthogonal nature to it, this independence that allows you to effectively um, deploy pieces and parts and scale them independently. Um, you also have the ability to update them. You have the ability to modify those pieces independently. So there's a there's a great amount of survivability in a cloud native architecture. And I think that lends itself, um, well, standards wise, it lends itself to the way it was conceived. But I think operationally, as we look at greater scale in and also the greater sort of proliferation of 5G, uh, it's an end dimensional network design, you know, as more customers come on board and more slices are defined for uh, various services in the network, uh, the complexity goes up exponentially. So it's effectively, you know, uh, you need to have that separation, you need to have that ability to be able to modify, change, deploy, heal, recover, uh, destroy, if you will, um, those slices and uh, cloud native greatly enables that. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yes, Andrea. Uh, yes, uh, a quick comment on this. Um, uh, I personally think that uh, um, 5G, uh, together with cloud native, is, uh, is the key uh, for telcos uh, for the transition between, let's say, traditional way of approaching business, uh, mainly selling uh, connectivity towards a platform concept. So uh, shifting towards uh, offering capabilities on top of a platform through APIs, as, as Nathan uh, currently said a few, few minutes ago. And the, the key for this transition, which is a uh, huge business transition, uh, in addition to uh, technology innovation, uh, I think the key is exactly uh, 5G that was designed to uh, embrace uh, cloud native, true, together with the uh, let's say the, the, the beauty of the technology coming from uh, the, the, the cloud world, the IT world, uh, so the, the, the cloud net. Great, thank you. Um, so if there aren't any further comments here, I'm going to hand back to Guy and then I'm going to take a look as the questions 
have absolutely flooded in here. I'm going to hand back to Guy, take a look at what we've uh, got, been coming in here. Guy, over to you. Yes, thank you, Ray. Um, the floodgates have well and truly opened up. But before we move on to our next viewer question, let me tell you about the series of polls we are running. Every day this week, we are posting a new poll question related to the theme of the day. And each question is a simple multiple choice. Five answers, basically ranging from I agree to I disagree. Now, it only takes a few seconds, so please click on your choice of answer and have your say. The poll is right here on the website. Now, today's question, is our telcos successfully adapting their cultures to suit the cloud-oriented digital era? And you can see the current split of opinions right here on the screen. And it's quite a wide split. Obviously, there's an outly there at the bottom, but uh, quite a wide split. So maybe it's a, it's a bit of a yes but response there. Um, we're going to have more votes coming in for this one, so we'll, we'll check in again at the end of the week. Uh, but make sure your vote is counted. Go ahead and click on the poll if you haven't already done so. OK, back to our Q&A. Keep the questions coming in. It's very much your programme. Ray, do you have another question ready for us? Yes, uh, I do. Um, and so this question is for, for the whole group, whoever wants to, to, to grab onto this one. Uh, and this one is... Uh, how do you think upskilling could be planned by the telcos for their employees? Um, if we want to get to transformation, what steps need to be taken? Um, so this is really about upskilling and how this can be enabled within the telecom operators. So uh, does anybody want to take a crack at that? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's really important that we can provide um, staff with kind of pathways if you like for upskilling um, but also I think it's really important that people can take that kind of journey on on their own back as well so what we're doing is really looking at what is the pathway from for example maybe working on a legacy platform to then becoming a software engineer on you know a, a cloud platform and then providing our staff with all of the learning opportunities that they need to go through and you know um, pairing them up with other members of the team in order to get some of those um, on the job skills as well. And it's, it's it's a journey that takes quite a bit of time, but I think it's one that we can really kind of clearly show people how they can get there. Um, but as I said before, I also think it's just really important for people to be looking at what are the skills that are coming down the line and what can I do as an individual to personally develop myself into some of those skills. Um, we have a lot of really good tools and platforms that we provide staff um, in order for them to, be, to do that personal development, um, as well as I mentioned the, the kind of pathways that we can give them to help them, help them through that. Okay, great, thanks Angela. Um, so uh, upskilling in the telcos, is, is there maybe more focus on these days as, as there's more of a shift to um, towards uh, cloud-oriented platforms. Do, does anybody else want to, to comment on this uh, this trend at all? I would just say in general, there's you know quite a, a wealth of information in say the network operations organizations inside telcos that could be parlayed into improving services inside of, you know from a customer experience perspective. And I think you know as you find people inside roles in maybe a purely operational sense, they have information and insight perspective that can be applied in a different context that can uh, you know potentially be applied to launch a new service with the business oriented you know parts of the telecom business and and be able to influence um, better outcomes so based on the fact that they understand how customers use the networks and and how where the problems exist and potentially how to solve those problems okay great yeah that that's a great point uh, and uh, I, I do wonder how many organizations have that kind of model in place to be able to uh, to exploit that kind of uh, understanding. Uh, Andrea, let's come to you. I think this this cultural change uh, within Telco is is taking place. Uh, my observation point is the observation point from an innovation department. So maybe uh, we are a bit. Uh, slightly ahead, but uh, honestly, my experience is I was surprised by the, the, the speed and the, the enthusiasm with which uh, people uh, have been uh, reskilling uh, themselves with the help 
of tools, uh, of training, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also with, with the, their own effort and the world, their own curiosity. Uh, and uh, I've seen people moving very fast from I don't know uh, optical technology, uh, getting becoming expert in the in in, in the IT software and uh, uh, open source in a very uh, surprisingly short amount of time. So I'm really optimistic about this. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's excellent to hear. And of course, if people want to do it themselves and they have that enthusiasm and drive and desire, then that makes the process all, all the more quicker and enjoyable, of course. Um, okay. If there aren't any more, oh, sorry, Honoré. Yes. I think that there's an interdependency between the cultural transformation and the business model transformation. And that's what many of uh, the telecoms are experiencing, you know, in, uh, in parallel. So it's difficult to detach the two. And as we look at cultural transformation and we look at the need to transform the business models uh, to be able to leverage the technology and optimize all of the innovation that's happening in the telecom industry, the, the cultural change and the business model change is interdependent with each other. And I think in many ways that makes it more difficult, um, but in other ways, it also is a catalyst. One will help the other move forward. As you, as, as we experience the cultural change, it's highly recognized that there's a need for a business model change. And conversely, as you start to drive business model changes, there is a need to drive those cultural transformation changes as well. So I think that's part of the reason why there's this appearance of it taking time in order to kind of cross that chasm because it's not just a cultural change in and of itself. It's, it's much more integrated with other aspects of the transformational journey for our telco customers. Absolutely. Great point. These developments are not happening in silos. The silos are being broken down. Absolutely. Um, Guy, so I'm going to hand over to you because we've, we've had more questions come in. Thank you, Ray. Uh, well, here's a question hot off the press as well. What lessons have you learned in creating software-centric or cloud-centric teams? And are you confident that you can scale this approach throughout a telco's current workforce? Well, I guess th th this question is focused on telcos, but it's applicable to, to, to all of you. Um, anybody got any views on, on how we can scale this cloud-centric, software-centric approach? And you know, Is it possible to scale it right the way through uh, a telco's workforce? I do think this um, relates to some of the previous stuff that Honoré was talking about and also Stephen around. Um, a lot of it's about the ways of working and that's really what we're trying to do as we're moving to you know, more digital services and moving into the cloud. We're changing the way that our teams are working and interacting with each other. And that is part of this big cultural shift that we're going through. Angela, I think you're breaking up there. I think we might have to sort of leave you temporarily where we'll get a quick fix done in the backgrounds and hopefully hopefully come back to you on that point because you're making some um, excellent points there. But we'll just do some behind the scenes fixes um, as we continue on. And, and anybody else in our panel got uh, any thoughts on being able to scale up the way we're approaching this cloud native uh, development work? Uh, Stephen, thank you. Yeah, so so part of, the, I think, the journey that most of our customers are on is to drive more focus around the customer experience. And ultimately, I mean, all the plumbing that's in place and all of, if you will, the automation and, and if you will, the value of the network, it's really tied directly to the subscriber's customer experience, whether that be an enterprise customer or a mobile consumer. Um, and so if every part of the telecom organization has the ability to sort of take that CX-centric viewpoint, I think uh, irrespective of the technologies that are being used, I think they can drive culturally towards which will align directionally with where the technology is going. But I think if they, they drive in that direction towards customer uh, experience and customer experience centric mindsets, they'll naturally start to move away from the silos and across the silos, they'll start to unify. Uh, and then the technology layers, I believe, will will start to fall in. As far as you know, getting them upskilled so that everyone is a part of the journey, um, you know, that's that's independent, I think, depending on the organization and how they operate and, and the size. But um, I think if they start with a CX mindset, it will benefit them greatly. Mm -hmm. Good points. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Well, look, let's try and uh, go back to um, Angela and see if uh, we've reconnected with Angela. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I, I think I was saying that, yeah, we're, we're seeing real successes in the ways of working, but you know, it is, it is a big thing to scale up in an organization of our size. So I think, um, I think we, we can use some of those um, lessons that we're learning and some of the experimentation across the different areas start to see that shift happening. And I think one of the huge benefits is the uh, collaboration, the breaking down of silos. And, and Stephen, you mentioned earlier about really bringing that operational knowledge into the teams that are, are kind of building the, the software and building platforms. And we're really seeing that starting to take shape. So um, I, I feel very positive about um, you know, the opportunity that we have to scale that. Fantastic, that's, that's good to hear. Andrea, you'd like to come in on this as well. Um, I think it has been mentioned already, the fact that uh, this is not just a um, uh, technology uh, revolution, it's also business revolution. And I, uh, I mentioned as well that the transformation of uh, telco business towards the, the, the platform concept. Well, I think the, 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 the right way to, to, to scale up uh, the cloud native culture is um, making people aware of this, uh, let's say, relevant business side of this process. Um, by uh, trying to show the, 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 the big picture behind this, the transformation that the, the, the telco business is undergoing, uh, you get the, 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 the right way uh, uh, to having people involved and to scale up the, the, this cultural transformation. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for, for that, that comment as well. Um, well, I think we'll go over to Ray because I think we, uh, we probably have time for, to squeeze in another couple of questions we can get answered. So, Ray, over to you for our next question. OK, great. Thanks, Guy. Uh, OK, we have a question in here from somebody. I'm going to break this into two parts uh, because the, 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 this questioner, this uh, audience member today, believes that there is a, a reluctance within the telecoms industry uh, to, uh, to leave legacy technologies and services behind uh, very quickly. So, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, ob uh, a lot of technology and services that might be made obsolete in the coming years, but this isn't happening fast enough. And the question is, you know, if, if this is the case, is this because of regulatory barriers or is it a reluctance within the leadership of the operators to make these technologies and services obsolete. Um, so would anybody like to pick up on that? Maybe, uh, maybe challenge that assumption. Uh, Stephen? Coming from the software industry, you know, there's always going to be challenges with moving to the next generation of what you offer. And I think that's a, a problem that the telecom industry faces in that um, telcos have multiple generations of networks that they support as they deploy new ones. They have legacy. Um, they have uh, legacy infrastructure that's tied to those earlier investments. And, and in many ways, they have to keep those operational because they have important customers who are using them. They have to find pathways to safely migrate and offer value add on top of whatever else they're building. So as you move from, say, 4G to 5G, you know, it's really about the value proposition to the customer, what's in it for them. It's about opening the opportunity up to that customer. It's about giving them visibility and what they can do with that new capability or those services tied obviously to a business goal, which is as Andrea said several times. Um, so yeah, honestly, it, it's, uh, you're going to have legacy technologies for a while as a, you know, someone who worked in the software industry for the last several you know, decades, I can tell you multiple versions of products that are in market for many, many years. And what you have to do is help customers find the way to that next generation of, of technology and make it easy for them to make that move as they migrate to the next step. Yeah, great point, Stephen. Thanks. Do, does anybody want anybody else? Uh, sorry, Nathan? Yes, Nathan. Yeah, yeah. No, may, maybe I'll, I'll provide an alternative to that. You know, I mean, of course, as as Stephen said, there's 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 clearly a a need to to change through the technology. But I think another one of the the challenges that we see is is with various products we offer. So we build a lot of custom products for specific customers, and and typically when you build a product specifically for a customer, uh, that's a high value customer and a high value product. And and when the technology moves forward and that customer still uses that same product. That is, of course, where you kind of get stuck continuing to maintain some of these legacy products, not because we want to necessarily maintain the legacy 
uh, the legacy technology, but because we've got some some quite valuable business that keeps running on those uh, technologies that we we still want to maintain. Absolutely, yes, we've we've heard this time and time again. Uh, at the same time as we hear pressure from people saying, but those services need to be migrated and brought up to date and, and, and customers need to be given incentives. But it's, 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 a real, uh, it's a real tension in the industry for sure, no doubt. Okay, if there are no more comments on that one. Guy, uh, I know we're coming close to time, but can we get one more question in? Oh, we can certainly get one more question in, right? Absolutely. Um, this question we've got, I've got a feeling this comes from one of our regular viewers because he refers to um, one of yesterday's panels. Uh, and the question is that the panel yesterday suggested that telcos should write more of their own software in-house. Do you agree? And what effect would this have on the DNA of a telco? I mean, it relates into the whole cloud-centric, software-centric story we're talking about today. So if, if a telco goes down this route and does a lot of this themselves in-house, how does that actually affect what the telco is, what, what the service provider is or the service provider is becoming? Any thoughts from our guests on, on this topic? I, I think that there is a lot of value in writing own software, but I think that um, we need to be strategic about what we actually want to write. I mean, there's there's a lot of different technologies in our network, and if we try to write all of them ourselves, um, we'll spin our wheels quite a bit. And I know there's, there's some key technologies that differentiate ourselves from our competitors. And I think that if we do want to go down the path of, of writing software and, and maintaining software, we need to really take and choose to do it on those strategic business uh, aspects of things. So for instance, I mean, all you have to do is look at all the other tech companies that exist in the world they don't necessarily write 100% of their software. They, they use other software. They, they integrate software from various open source communities and, and maybe they even use public clouds to host a lot of their things, um, you know, but I think that's where technology and needs to, to shift for us. And, and we need to, as a telco, be very strategic about, um, you know, where we look to write code, but I absolutely think there is a lot of value for us to, to start becoming a software house, but only on the strategic pieces. Thank you, Nathan, good points there. Yes, focus on the strategic elements there. Uh, okay, we, we've got a few more um, comments from our guests. So, um, Andrea, let me come to you first. Uh, yes, quickly. Um, I, I also agree that, that there's a value in developing uh, some uh, part of code uh, in-house. Uh, of course, the, this uh, I don't see this as a trend that uh, will go in, in, in every area. Um, as Neta said, the strategic area are, are, are to be selected. I think many of us already had quite good, uh, let's say, uh, knowledge and the use to develop, develop in, in house in some areas like the, the OSS, the BSS, and. Consequently, I think in the in the cloud native approach, uh, very high value area like uh, automation orchestration uh, could definitely follow the same so even increasing the amount of code that could, could be developed in house then there are some other other areas like in the system integration that becomes more and more heavy and, and needed uh, with the disaggregation uh, maybe you won't need uh, to follow the same path so it depends on on the area but generally speaking i see uh, development in house is increasing Great, thank you, Andrea, for those viewpoints. And Honoré? I was going to emphasize Nathan's point about, and Andrea's uh, as well, about the strategic value of doing software development in-house. I think it really depends on what business outcomes you're trying to drive and what differentiated value services that you want to take to market and then compare that or map that to you know, the, cost, the most cost of effective way to be able to deliver those differentiated services. And so that ties back to the comment that both Nathan and Andreas make around focusing on the strategic elements first. I don't think it's an all or nothing or one or the other. I think it's a combination of taking different approaches based on what the business outcomes are uh, aspiring to achieve. Great. Consensus on our, on our final question of, of this after show by the looks of it. Well, unless there's uh, any of the comments to be made. I, I think we should wrap up the program for today in that case. Thank you all very much indeed. It's the end of the after show for today. Thanks to all our guests who joined us 
for this live programme and to our audience for sending in your questions. Now we'll be back tomorrow with another live after show programme. In the meantime, Ray and I are going to go off and find a bottle of wine and see if any food is left, which is what usually happens after one of our after show evenings in the days of physical events. Absolutely. Uh, and that would be the day old prawns and the warm white wine that would be we would be quaffing, of course. Um, now, if you haven't yet watched our two round tables and interviews from today, then they are available now on demand, along with all of our other exclusive interviews. And tomorrow's theme at DSP Leaders World Forum is 5G and sustainability. And we've got two more round tables for you, followed again by our live Q&A show. We hope to see you then. For now, though, thank you for watching and goodbye. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience.